Welcome back, everyone, for another edition of The Final Mile, where we answer all your questions. We've pulled them off of YouTube comments from our uh, direct um, emailed in questions. So continue to send those our way. Um, and please take a moment to check out the sponsors in the description box to help support this channel. Quickscope, Levity, Blue Book Services, and DAT. And check out the Freight Broker Basics course on our website, Freight360.net, if you'd like a full-length option for education to get your brokerage started and grow it successfully. Four questions today, and we've got... Let's go with the first one here. I'm a new broker looking for insights on how to retain the brokerage and be successful. Um Pretty pretty vague question, but I thought it was I, I put this one in here because I, I think wanted it's to retrain or is it retain? I think they meant retrain because when I read it, I wasn't sure what they were asking. Either way, okay. I would say here is a good some best overall like high level best practices on how to be successful in this industry is kind of the way that I would look at it. And between the three of us here, we won't go too deep into it, but we probably all have a little bit different perspective on um the best way to succeed in this industry. So I'll uh, I'll give some some of my tips, and then we'll go Ben to you, and then Stephen. Um, I think in, in any business for to be successful, I'm big on like communication and like your long term vision. Um, so I would say don't go into if you're going to start a brokerage or if you have one started and you're looking to to grow it, um, know what's in front of you, right? Like look look high on your steering is something that we used to say at Conway Freight, not just not just five meters in front of you, but look out, you know, three, you know, 300 feet, 500 feet. So how does that turn into, into um, freight brokerages? Look out six, 12 months from now, also three, five years from now, right? If you start a brokerage and you're in a certain market cycle, it is going to change inevitably. So I would tell you, my tip would be to, um, you know, have that mindset of it's going to change. I, and because of that, I need to always, always make sure that my pipeline is, full and on the activities going in um, to be able to account for turnover in business and things of that nature. Uh, ben, what would you say? I'm, ass I'm assuming you're going to go more of the practical uh, in the trenches activity. I, but think, I think that's really important what you said, right? And I'll throw a proverb out there, right? Which is like, if you know why you're doing it, you can endure anyhow. You want to really understand why you want to build a business of any business of any type for any reason, right? Like knowing why you want to do it helps you when the days and things get hard and difficult and you're going to be frustrated and not want to, right? Being able to remind yourself yeah, why exactly. you're in this, I think to your point, is that vision where we want to go? Why do we want to go there is vital to anybody starting a company. And then I think, you know, once you have that at least answered for yourself and that changes over time, like it could start for this reason and two years it could change. Like it doesn't need to stay the same the entirety of your career and whatever it is. But I think to tie that into like some practical things, right? Like, I was talking with a guy yesterday, a good friend of mine who sells lots of businesses. He's been doing it for like 30 years. And the thing we were both talking about is like, there's kind of a blueprint to do most things. And like, once you realize it, like if you just consistently do that thing every day, like I have never seen anybody in our industry. I've told this story a lot, like that makes calls every day follows up in the ways that we explain, meaning following up every week, shorten that up as you get a better relationship. But like the basics, like what are you doing every day? Meaning like you should be making at least 60 to 70 outbound phone calls and you should be adding to your leads every week as you get rid of the ones that you've worked out, right? If your output is, I would say, averaging 80 calls a day over every single week and you are follow up in ways that we've discussed in other videos and content, right? Like as to maybe some more specifics, like, I've never seen anybody not end up with customers and to some degree find success, whether they keep growing and enjoy it. That's one thing, whether they get some success and decide it's not for them and leave, like those are all personal choices. But I mean, being able to work at like a large brokerage when I started, like I saw thousands of brokers and hundreds would be turning over every few months. And like, you see the same thing over and over. Like I could pull a report any given week and tell you what was the most likely person to not have a job in six months and who is the likely person to have real customers. They all have the exact same thing in common, which is simple output. They make more phone calls. They talk to more people. They follow up more. That's how you get customers. And I think most people, when they've hired us in the past, like I've had so many clients that we've even turned down that go, 
they expect us to give them like the easy route or the easy button. Like, give me the magic phrase to say that all customers say yes and give me freight. Like there isn't one of those in any industry. What there is, is the guidance of what to do to set up your habits every day. If you do those things, you'll get sales. And then to your point, Nate, like you got to focus and make sure you have procedures in place for what you're going to do after that. Write them down, share those with your team. Everybody should be on the same page with what is the simple things that happen. The steps to dispatch a load all the way through invoicing, right? Everybody should know who's responsible for what. There should be no ambiguity or gray area in who's responsible for what aspect of anything in your business. It should be written down and it needs to be shared often and reminded until people remember it. Giving somebody a training manual for a week when they start does not help them three months because they are not remembering that. You need to keep reminding your team who's responsible for what and bringing this up until it becomes second nature, right? The most successful companies do this very well. They call it culture. The ones that don't fall apart because nothing's holding them together. It's just the hope of money at some point, And nobody really even understands how and what they're doing with each other, let alone working as like a cohesive unit or a company. So, yep. Steven, what do you got to add? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, the biggest thing that I've seen is in this industry, it's, I mean, it's a hustle and you're just grinding hours and hours, especially in the beginning and a, a and the feedback that dopamine from getting a new customer or moving that first load or whatever is so few and far between, especially in the beginning that yes. you need to establish a way in which you can take a break from that. That's not detrimental to your progress, but gives you a little bit of a break to not feel like you're grinding and hustling every single hour of every day. Agreed. Yeah. The burnout's yeah. real for sure. Yeah. So. All right. We good used stuff. to, I was just going to say, like, I don't want I wouldn't recommend this and I wouldn't do this now, but like back in the day, like we all drank coffee and smoked cigarettes. Like that was <laughs> literally the reason to leave the office. I'm like, Smoke I don't even break. really like smoking after yeah. a while. I'm like, I remember like, mom, like, I'm just going to go walk around, but it just gave you an excuse to get away from your desk, talk to some people about other things, whatever life, and then go back a little bit fresher, rinsing your face off underrated, very helpful to do periodically to just keep you focused and to give yourself a break. Great point. All right. Uh, next question. This kind of spins right into it is I'm a new broker. How do I find leads to call? Um, so I'm going to, I'll rattle some off here. And we, these are kind of like doctrinal ones that we use over and over in our content. It's not all encompassing. Um, we have a ton of full length content on this. If you just go to our website and look up lead generation or um, how to find shippers. You'll see this stuff, but everyday items, everything around you, most likely the majority of it was shipped on a truck. That'll give you some ideas. Referrals, um, look at your BOL, see where you're delivering to, ask customers for other customer referrals. There's plenty of databases out there like your Blue Book services, Zoom Info, Seamless.ai, Chamber of Commerce, Hoover's, um, internet, Google, right? You can use chat GPT now to generate a bunch of leads for you, you know, chat GPT, give me the top 50 steel manufacturers in the United States. Boom. You're going to have a whole bunch of them come out that way. Um, LinkedIn is great trade shows, um, networking and organizational databases of like member directories. They're, they're endless, right? So I think that the takeaway here is don't try to do all of them all at once, find what works for you and you can do it efficiently. And that's probably a good place to start. What would you add then? Or at least uh, how, to, how to do it the right way. I, I think what you, I mean, those are great places to look at. I think the two things that I add, I was just training someone on this yesterday, is I also look for like larger trends in the whole economy, like things in the news, things that tend to be happening across the whole industry, because that gives me like a whole group of leads to go after, right? Yes. And like, I've said this a lot, but like, like 2017, when there were steel tariffs, like that affected the whole steel industry. And I don't care if it goes up or down. I just care that it changes. The lanes are changing for those shippers because where they're buying things and selling them is changing. That creates opportunity, right? Anytime there's change happening across the whole industry, to me, that's a good indication that there's some opportunity to get some new customers. And the other thing I think is, and we talk about this in an episode, prospecting with a purpose, it's how you're grouping your leads and making sure they're grouped together in a way that you're not calling random companies in one day, like talking to an orange grower, then a steel company, then this, because it's really hard to learn from any one of those phone calls and apply it to the next. 
So when you're pulling the leads from like these sources, like to me, I think you should pick that target and then pull like a hundred or 150 leads in that niche, work those for a week or two, see what you learn, and then determine if you're going to add another one. And then maybe you add the second, maybe you add a third, and maybe you drop the first one because there weren't as many opportunities as you thought they were once you actually have conversations with some of these shippers as to what they're experiencing. And I think, you know, the only other thing I would add is like the execution of the leads, meaning like, I know this is where you find them. You can also find them anywhere, like Google, chat GPT to just get some ideas as to what a good target is. Executing them takes time. You got to go into the, those apps you talked about, like Seamless AI or Apollo or Zoom Info and maybe LinkedIn. And some of them are expensive, some are cheaper, but it takes time. And what I want to point out about finding leads is it should be the only thing you're doing when you're doing that task. You shouldn't be doing this, then calling, then doing this, because you're not going to really improve at finding leads. Finding leads is like doing research, kind of like when you're in college or when you're writing a paper. You spend all of your time reading and looking for places. It gets you better at finding them. So I think the more you block that out and treat it as a really vital aspect of building your book of business, you should be blocking out an hour or two at the very least every week at first, probably every day to just literally <clears throat> spend two hours finding them, adding them to your CRM, not just calling them once and trying to remember who you're going to call next week. Yeah. And that brings up a good point. I'm going to actually, I'm going to read off a, another question that we had here because it kind of ties in is how can I get someone on the phone when every company seems to have a phone answering system? So like, um, this is something that I, I did a, a calling session uh, recently with somebody and you'll see like how every company handles like getting through their phone system and through the gatekeeper. They're all a little bit different, but they're all kind of designed in somewhat of a similar way where they're trying to prevent unnecessary calls coming into people whose time is important. Right. And our goal yep. is just the opposite. We want to, we want to be the one that gets through that. And um, it could be a phone tree where you're talking to an automated system, press one for this or another extension. It could just be a, uh, an operator. Uh, it could be a receptionist or uh, you know anything along those lines. And it is hard to get into or to get to the right person. So the, the couple of tips that I would give, and then I'll turn it to you guys and see what you're using tactically. But um, some of the systems that we just mentioned, like Apollo, Zoom Info, make sure that you're doing your research to try and get the extension of the person if you can, or a cell phone number if you can. Um, because that'll help you. Another thing too, if you talk to a human being and you could just say, Hey, I think I got sent to the wrong place. I was looking for Jim over in transportation. Could you give me his extension, please? Because if you just get transferred, you don't know that person's extension to call them direct. If you can get their extension, boom, now you know right where to go next time. But a lot of times they're like, ah, like, no, I'll, I'll transfer you through. You can leave them a message because they're, they're smart enough. Another way too is um, to bypass the gatekeeper go around the gatekeeper, find another department to get you redirected. Like call a, someone in accounting who doesn't know that you're trying to, you know, make a sales call or a prospecting call or a salesperson for all that matter to try and get you over to the transportation. That way you're not getting a general logistics or traffic department gatekeeper there. But what, what would you add um, in addition there? I want to add one and then I want to kick to Steven is like, I try to think about the phone system. Just like you said, they're not the same, but they're fairly similar in what they're designed to do. Well, who gets the most prospecting calls? Executives, logistics, they're usually the harder part to go through. But that phone system is also designed in a way like just like a gatekeeper. It's not just that they keep people out. They also have to let the most important people through. Otherwise, they upset customers. So what phone calls and what numbers or departments do they want less friction? Accounts payable? Like you said, accounting. If you're calling to pay a bill, they don't want you holding them. They want you directly to whoever so they can take that money, right? Service, right? If there's a service line, like someone's usually answering that, right? And then to your point, like I usually just play like, there's two ways they frame this is like the shy little kid or like the confused old man. But I'm just like, hey, like... And I intentionally like kind of stutter when I ask. And I'm just like, I, I'll i tell you what, Paul, can you maybe give me a hand? I am having a hell of a time trying to find an extension for, and then I drop the name for the guy in logistics. And I'm like, do you think you could maybe just find that for me? And if they go, yeah, I'll transfer you. I go, hey, hold on. Before you transfer me, just in case I get dropped, can I write that extension down? Now I have it forever, right? Yep. One phone call gets me most of what I need usually to be able to get transferred directly to that person. Perfect. 
Steven, what do you Steven. got? Yeah, that's that's usually my take is if I can't get through because a lot of the new systems that I've come across are uh, into the first three letters of the last name or the first name. And they never and work. Like, oh, my gosh. It never works. So then I'll go, I'll look at the LinkedIn and I'll look at who's in accounting, who's in billing, because obviously these people aren't going to be on that list. And I'll put in their name. I'll be like, look, I just got transferred here from somebody in another department. This is who I'm trying to get a hold of, just like you said. Yep. Um, and it's, you it, can't I mean, get through the gatekeeper, to, go around the gatekeeper. Right, exactly. And then especially talking to other salespeople for that company, usually they want to break from their calls too. So oh, if you yeah. just and you can learn so much about their company too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so you can learn what, where they're selling to or who they're selling to. And then that's just more stuff to put in your back pocket when you get to your person you want to talk to. Yep. Sales is answering all the calls. They're not they're yeah. not screening anybody that comes and wants to buy right. something from them or hey, pay a bill. And then the last thing I wanted to say, going back to the previous question about leads, is uh, when new people come here, the first thing I always ask them is, what are your hobbies? What are your interests? And so, for example, if they say like football. I was like, okay, what does it take to play football? You need a helmet. You need a jersey. You need cleats. Who makes all that stuff? Where do they get the product from? Find the companies do your research, something that they're interested in and then find your leads that way. And then we can talk about other things. Had a guy years ago that moved uh, turf for uh, artificial turf for sports complexes. Really cool. Really cool. But Hey, that's a, it's a pretty niche if you're a big sports person. All right, our last question, this is a, I kind of feel like they uh, thought we were stockbrokers, but I, I brought up a good point to talk about finance. So it said, do you see changes coming as trade settles with the advent of crypto like XRP? I think that's Ripple that settles instantly versus using letters of credit, which takes time to settle. Um, this was a YouTube comment. I almost feel like they're probably like, oh, something with brokers that's probably stockbrokers. But I had I wanted to at least uh, have a discussion about how funds move. But did you I mean, unless I'm missing something in this question, do you guys see anything in here that's freight brokers related or no? No, but okay. I mean, it is an applicable point, right? Of just, it could be a use case in our industry for sure. Yeah. So, so the thought I had here is this, like we are a, a cash flow business and there are still some old school, like I shouldn't even say some, there's a lot of like paper checks being sent in the mail. Like every single day we have the mail comes and they do a check run to get all the checks that came in to the bank so they can get deposited and clear so those funds are available so that we can pay our carriers. Um, some brokerages send checks out to their carriers, some do ACH, um, but our banking system is evolving to a point where I think it's, isn't it like either this year or next year, they're supposed to basically have like almost instant depositing and verification of like transactions through. So you're not like, if I'm gonna wire money to you, to your company, it shouldn't take three days anymore. And it does. Like right now it takes like three days unless you pay extra yes. money and it's like same day. Right. But I do think that this, when we get to a place when money moves faster, almost instantly, you're going to really see the muddying of waters on days to pay is going to be gone. You can't have that. Oh, you know, we, uh, we sent, you know, we, we scheduled the wire. It should hit in like three to four days. Like if customers are slow paying, they're just straight up slow paying. There's no excuses. And same thing with carriers. Um, if you want a quick pay, you can lit you'll literally be able to do an instant quick pay, like almost like you're selling somebody money, um, and that'll be a huge value add, I think. Versus, hey, I can do a an EFS check if you want it instantly, but it's going to be come with a uh, a fee because um, they have to have a processing fee. Um, versus, hey, I can schedule an ACH to you; you'll get it in three days. I think the way that money moves will be a, a value add. It's also going to be probably a, a, a vulnerability. If you think back to our little cybersecurity conversation on the last episode, but what do you think? I mean, do you think there's any takeaway here on how the movement of money will impact our industry? Cause I mean, we we're just a big bank that helps move trucks. I, yeah. Like the two first things I have in mind is like, not everybody wants the money to move faster. A lot of the reason the companies require True. or make checks sent is to buy the extra few days yep. to keep their money in the account. So like not always the best for both sides. The other thing too, is like, I haven't looked into what XRP's ability to settle instantly is, but it's just I know- a crypto. 
It's a it's a yeah, but like historically Bitcoin. the number of transactions that it could hold in the processing time was like a factor of like a thousand slower than like what a what currently our normal system does. Like it couldn't handle the volume or the speed anywhere near as fast as what we can do in the traditional system. And that was a lot of the pushback with crypto over the past few years is like, yeah, there's some pros to it. There's also cons, but one is like it's not as effective as a means to transfer money as the traditional system in a lot of ways because the speed per current transaction was just much slower than like what an Amex could basically do. Like mm. it was it was um, exponentially slower. And again, maybe XRP's ability to settle instantly is why they're asking the specific question because it hadn't been. That was an issue. The other thing is like they talk about crypto and like to me, there's some other issues. One is that like, you don't know your customer. You don't know where you're sending it. There's more opportunity for fraud because you don't have a bank that is regulated where the money's going. So it does make crime actually easier to facilitate in some ways. And like, I've read a bit on it and like the FBI, the one thing is like, they're like, yeah, like that's true. But also there's an immutable record, meaning like once it goes to somebody and then goes to someone else, you never can get rid of that thing that happened, that transaction. Which means once they catch somebody, they can find everything they've ever done because it's literally like basically written in stone. Yeah. Like there's just this record of any money they've ever handled. So like, I, I don't know. I, I just know that a lot of my friends and a lot of the guys that work in banking still in finance are like, it's just not better than what we have. And there's no real reason to transition to something different that isn't better than what we currently have. Yeah. But you're right. Like ACH is for a reason, like automated clearinghouse. It takes three days because that money goes to a federal reserve, I believe, and then goes to the bank you're sending it to. And that's for the protection of the money transfer, not just to make it longer, it's so they can verify things on both ends, right? Yeah, I mean, the sending bank and the receiving bank, and then I think, is it the clearinghouse in the middle that's got a, yeah. they're all involved. That's why it takes, Correct. as long as it takes, so. But isn't, isn't crypto, like the value of crypto, really volatile? Yeah, well? I mean, there, that's a whole other part of it. So, I, I think right. just the technology of it is kind of a, where I took the question, but yeah, I don't think crypto is going to be the... Yeah. Because the, because the one thing I, truck drivers anytime like soon. if I'm getting paid from a customer, the one thing I would hate is like we agreed to like two thousand and then I get now it's worth fifteen hundred. That thing is now worth fifty bucks. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, is it is it? I'd rather, just give me cash. Like that's cool. <laughs> yep. U.S. dollars, baby. All right. Good questions. Keep sending them our way, and we will we will keep answering them. Uh, final thoughts, uh, Stephen. Got any final thoughts? Nope, just keep tuning in. We love talking to you guys. The comments are great. I like interacting with everyone on there. So it's fun. Yeah, agreed. Ben? Whether you believe you can or believe you can't, you're right. And until next time, go Bills.